Hey guys, what's up? It is week 279, and to start this out, we're going to draw for the Slimy Little Bastards Blu-ray from Toxic Filth. I got a random number generator right here, and all the no names listed. It's going to take a little bit of work here, but we're going to hit first. This is the first time. So it's number 30. I'm going to go back to... Sorry about this. I have to do, you know... So whoever 30 is on... I should have had my sheet, but I'm doing it on live, so we'll see who the winner is. I will send it to you ASAP. Um, if you didn't send your, um, what is it? If you didn't send your address or whatever and you won, then, uh, get with me and I will send it ASAP. But if your address is already there, it'll be much easier. Sorry, load time. Bad Wi-Fi back here. We're going to have to walk to the Wi-Fi <laughs> to make it quicker. Sorry about this, guys. There we go. Ban dun 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 Number 30, isn't the suspense killing you all? I know this week I have a few movies to review, but I also have a bunch of 1980 stuff, a lot of rewatches, so we'll be kind of brief with those. Going down to the bottom of the list, I have everybody listed here. And number 30 is Scott McMeachin. So congratulations, Scott, if you can read that. I will send it out ASAP. And uh, yeah, let's hop into the reviews. And the first one up is from Synapse Films, and everybody knows that sometimes they take a little longer to get these out, but it's always well worth the wait because they do such a magnificent job. And 1987's The Kindred is no different. This is directed by a pair of directors. I always forget their names. So Jeffrey Obrow and Stephen Carpenter. Now, they uh, did a movie in the 80s called The Power. No, uh, Dorm That Drip Blood. In the early 80s, 81, it was a slasher, a.k.a. pranks, made the video nasties list. Um, you know, it's a little dull in places, but it does have a couple gore scenes. I'm sure most people probably originally saw it when it was all cut up to pieces, probably didn't do it any favors. So then they made another movie, I think, in 84 or so, 85, called The 84, I think. The Power, which was kind of a supernatural kind of horror film. Um, probably my least favorite of the three they did, but then they came to their crowning achievement, I think, in their horror genre for them, and they did The Kindred from 1987. So, yeah, this this one it was stuck on VHS for years. So finally, when Synapse announced that they were going to do it a few years back, everyone was really excited to finally get their hands on a copy of this. Um, the Kindred is like a crazy science run amok um, experiment, amphibious creature, brother kind of horror movie. Uh, great title, great cover art with the creature in the jar. So essentially what happens here, um, it, um, there's like kind of a scientist and his mother is like a big into like studying what's like some marine life and all sorts of like genetic modification and all those kind of stuff and Kim Hunter from Planet of the Apes which is funny that she was like this this ape like humanoid ape person humanoid thing I know it was different reasons for it but now she's like experimenting on these like amphibious mixing of people so essentially on her deathbed she tells her son um, that you need to go to the house and destroy the experiment, destroy Anthony. And he's confused by it. Him and some of his friends go there to kind of tear the place down and look for the experiment if there is one. And at the same time, a, a person who admired um, her... Uh, the son's, uh, you know, Kim Hunter's work shows up and she wants to look into the experiments as well and she's obsessed with it. But she may have some ulterior motives. You kind of get that, the gist of that right away. There's also a mad scientist in Rudd Steiger who, you know, Rudd Steiger chooses scenery every chance he gets and this is no different. If anybody doesn't know who Rudd Steiger is, he's in great stuff like the Amityville Horror. He's in Big Knife that Arrow put out and a slew of other films including Fistful of Dynamite and... Um, what was it? Um, geez, the the vampire one, modern vampires. He's in a lot of B movies and A list movies. He's kind of a, a classic, uh, well respected actor who kind of chews it up sometimes. He's also in 1980s Wolf Lake. So essentially, what happens is they soon find out that there's something not right about the house. There is people getting hurt with stuff, and they they have this weird kind of like material on them or in their DNA that shouldn't be there. And they they figure out that um, Kim Hunter was making weird live specimens. There's a whole bunch of different kinds of creatures in this movie and different developmental stages of the monsters, which I absolutely loved. There is an amazing scene where the creature comes out of the watermelon. It's really graphic, great special effects. In fact, the monsters in this look fucking amazing. 
Um, and there's a really cool scene about it, like kind of a dungeon with insanity, really weird and wacky. Um, yeah, this movie is gooey. It's gory. It's just fun. Now, it's a little bit more slow paced than one would expect when you see 1987. You see creatures and monsters, but it delivers on all the goods. It has decent characters as well. None of them are perfect. And there is like a weird scientific man, like, uh, you know, science gone wild thing is kind of the main thing going on because there's multiple experiments. But the main kindred, man, it is awesome. The sets are awesome and all that. So there's a bunch of special features on here. All new 4K, high definition remastered on rated version of the film. New 5.1 English stereo sound remix. Sounded really good. All original 2.1 mono is also included. We have audio commentary with the directors, moderated by horror journalist Steve Barton. That's Uncle Creepy, if I'm not mistaken. Inhuman Experiments, The Making of the Kindred. An all new documentary, 52 minutes. This is the highlight as far as the special features are concerned. We have interviews with the writers and the, the filmmakers, some of the actors. I love that. They they recollect all the other stuff on, about the movie and stuff. A special combination, a compilation, sorry, of creature effects by artist Michael McCracken Jr. Never foreseen footage, 18 minutes. And then we have Still Gallery and the usual kind of stuff here. It is region free. It is only, what, 93 minutes. I recommend you guys check out The Kindred if you haven't seen it. Um, like I said, I used to have it on VHS and I always enjoyed it. And uh, it was one that I was always holding out on a rewatch. Um, because I knew there was a Blu-ray coming and I was not disappointed with uh, Synapse's release. There is a steel book as well. I don't know if that is sold out yet, so check it out. Okay, the next one up is from Dread Central, and this is, what's the director's name here? I want to make sure I get it right because I feel like he's going to be a name to remember. Tyler Cormack, and this is Tiny Cinema. Now, Tyler Cormack did a movie that came out a couple years ago called Butt Boy, which was essentially a serial killer movie about a guy, it's like an addiction story, but he, he sucks people up his butt and they disappear. It's really weird, it's really wild, it's really gross, it's really funny. So, if you like Butt Boy, Tiny Cinema is definitely for you. Now, this is an anthology, and uh, so basically let's hope this is the one bad thing i hate about covering anthologies i like to go these freestyle and sometimes i'll forget a skit that didn't stand out as much to me here and there so when it started it was just a very bizarre kind of element here you know it's a super weird movie and i didn't know it was this director at first and about like two three shorts in i was like man this feels familiar it has this weird sense of humor this weird sense of grossness that i i'm kind of vibing with but also off put by at the same time which is a compliment you know to be off put me is kind of strange so the first First one it pops up and it's just this uh, that's what she said it's kind of like this joke where somebody completely loses their mind and all this kind of weirdness this one is one of my least favorite of the bunch um, and then as we go on they get better and better for me so um, until eventually like I don't want to spoil every short because when you get into these shorts if you just run down every single thing that happens you're just essentially you know that is your review is telling the short stories of the shorts so um, but I will say there's a, a few highlights that I absolutely adored here um, the last one involving you know it, it plays on the jokes of kind of you know dad humor which i think is kind of like a thing that a lot of people have been making fun of like the dad humor a lot lately and i think it works you know it, it's kind of funny and, and there's just a couple uh, moments in this and the dialogue and everything that i thought was priceless like this short would have been one of the better ones in the abc's of death if it was in there um there's also uh, uh one that is ungodly uncomfortable uh, if you've ever you know a sex scene with an elderly person filmed and made exactly like a horror film it's just uncomfortable it's weird it feels like a part you know trauma movie at times in this just the way the costumes are and the characters are over the top in that one but it's not um there's also one on here about best buddies you know helping their friend out how to ejaculate this one is absolutely wild and ridiculous and visually it's pretty awesome at the same time um all in all as a whole um this one is just a really fun weird gross time that will have you often laughing and cringing and just shaking your head Another one I should mention is like the ultimate, you know, uh, cream pie, you know, person who wants the ultimate cream pie, which, oh my God, I can't believe this. I figured it was something like that, but it, I can't believe it. Like this whole elaborate scheme to just get something like that is just so awful. Anyways, this is a really gross movie. I don't know if it's if I like it more than its grossness uh, and whatnot. There is also, of course, one on here where a uh, girl 
um, is dating a dead person. It's just a lot of awkward humor as well, but it's really well done as far as like professionally done, like as far as cinematography and acting and, and sound design and all that stuff is there. It's just, um, I'm so glad that somebody's putting the effort in to make something this freaking weird still. So good stuff. Tiny cinema. Good on Dread Central for putting this out. We have some behind the scenes, official trailers and the Dread trailer. So check it out. It's, it's bonkers. Okay. The next one is from Draft House Films and MVD, and this is R100. And that's kind of like rated 100. It's supposed to be a take on the rating system that only anybody who's 100 can watch this. This was made in what, 2013 or something around that? I believe somewhere around that time frame. And this is a really bizarre movie. It's by the same person at Big big man japan which looks completely bonkers and strange and i i don't know how i i feel about this one the runtime is a little high it, it runs in i i remember it being like about a hundred minutes and i know people are like oh let's bring up every movie needs its runtime but i'm telling you it felt like a hundred minutes it felt like two hours so we have this uh kind of really japanese kind of businessman he is basically a single father his wife is very sick in the hospital he's raising his uh kid and his grandfather his father-in-law come around every once in a while so one day he decides to go to this strange um, kind of BDSM club and he signs up for this. And the thing is that you are completely submissive 100% and all, all times a day, 24 hours, these kind of, uh, you know, dominatrix can come into your life and beat you and, and humiliate you. And at first he seems to get some weird sort of almost, uh, you know, cosmic joy from the entire thing, or even in the pain, he feels joy, like he's punishing himself. Regardless, there he runs into all sorts of strange dominatrix, one who is the queen of saliva, and they all beat him in weird kind of ways. Eventually he wants out of the deal because this is not just working out when he has to go to work or he's visiting his wife in the hospital and they also start to get aggressive and and you know threaten his life in, in other ways in his family's life so this kiss cannot stand this aggression cannot stand okay so essentially what happens is there's kind of a war against him and the dominatrix which a lot of explosions surprisingly and weirdness and every once in a while we'll cut to a group of people that seem to be kind of working on you know the film as well and or discussing the film uh, live and they're just saying well why is this this and this that this doesn't make any sense to us and they're kind of explaining everything what's with the earthquake well this means this and and they'll also cut to the director who's actually not a hundred I don't believe but this is the director within the film who's supposed to represent the director of this film and it's just a, a weird kind of bonker deal there's a couple scenes that i did laugh out loud there's a couple moments i cringed you know the, the queen of saliva is a bit much for me to be honest but all in all it is a bizarre film um you know it is, I don't think there's any real sexual nudity in it. I mean, there are sexual situations, obviously, to BDSM, but I don't remember any actual nudity. When you think this would be a little bit more, you know, on the sleazy side or something, maybe like a pinky film or a Sato film, but it never really gets there. So I can't even give this the pervert card. This is definitely more of a comedy, drama, weird situational thing than something that you're looking, if you're looking for smut or anything like that, that's R100. Um, weird, strange, maybe not for you, maybe for you, I'm not quite sure. Uh, watch the trailer and and move on from there. Okay, the next one is an anthology. Just in time for Halloween, this is Spooky Dookie by Brian Papandrea, who did stuff like um, Feaster Sunday and Beyond Belief, Fact or Fiction, the Beyond Belief movies, which are very much in line with this movie. This is, like I said, a short kind of anthology with, I guess, a Halloween or a horse spin to it. Now, uh, this is essentially kind of a sequel to Beyond Belief, um, his kind of comedy anthology deal. And there is a character that does reoccur in this. So, Brian Papandrea well, as an indie actor, he's an indie director. I personally know him. He sent this over. So if I'm biased or anything like that, I'll try to be as unbiased as I can. So here we go. So like I said, there is a weird host that pops in and they're obviously making jokes about it, you know, kind of the goofiness of the host and they'll cut in trailers. And I noticed that, you know, it was edited by Zach Showalter, it was Showwatcher, who's a, a filmmaker out of Cleveland, does a lot of indie stuff as well and did a handful of stuff. I've worked with Zach before. He's a good guy as well. Um, as far as like the indie kind of Cleveland scene and everything like that. So uh, essentially I noticed they're kind of cutting in like old, like Halloween trailers and, and adverts and all this kind of stuff like that giving it kind of the wnuf halloween special kind of kind of gimmick although that one obviously gets more props because they actually made those commercials and the the visual look of the film is a hundred percent you know cohesive it all fits while this one you know sometimes you'll jump from you know high quality camera to those old kind of shoddy shots but that's okay you know they're setting a tone for the halloween spirit and all this kind of stuff and uh this this is one that you know if, if the humor on certain skits doesn't get to you i mean that's obviously not going to be you know one 
one that you adore maybe because the humor is very subjective so some of our hit and miss for me um we have a lot of different characters here i think that the second half of the shorts the second half of them are actually the ones that shine it's an hour runtime so it doesn't really wear out its welcome so we have one that uh was very much like an snl skit involving stds and james bond but this time we have dracula and he kind of pops up here and there we have a a woman who's fallen down and that kind of play comes into play later in the skit but really the ones that really stole the show were the last couple that i felt were actually very funny um and i don't even want to spoil the gimmick here but i thought it was the best acted the best done the longest and i thought brian did a great job memorizing i don't know if this character is speaking spanish or portuguese i'm not 100 percent sure I think it's Spanish, but, uh, you know, this character, he plays kind of an iconic character from Brazil. Now, think of an iconic horror character from Brazil, and if you know your shit uh, really well, you should know who this is, but it's, it's a great gimmick, and I, I loved it. I thought that was hilarious. A couple of people in here, Nathan Rumler is in that short, and uh, some other people you'd recognize. Um, and then the final skit is, of course, Brian, um, who is, is known to kind of poke fun at, you know, aspects of the indie horror genre that are insane or ridiculous that a lot of us do find that, and it, it is basically, you know, someone making fun of kind of the idea of crowdfunding uh, fan films, and and, and it's hilarious kind of stuff going on and possibly obviously using maybe some old, you know, family footage of a fan film that somebody made when they were very young involving Freddy Krueger. So so a lot of kind of jokes in the last two shorts, I think, are, are a little better. And they're the longest. But um, there's also a really gross gag involving Terrence Cover, which I thought was actually one of the highlights of the movie. And geez, that was so fucking gross. And I, I caught myself laughing at first. I was just disgusted, but it kind of won me over there. And what is a weird kind of spoofy kind of style in the 90s deal without a rap song during the credits i really don't know i mean and this is here it's spooky dookie it's weird it's goofy if you like brian's movies or you know even nathan rumler's movies the kind of comedy then i think you will enjoy this one if not then you probably want to steer clear of it but it's very much in the vein of beyond belief um his couple films i can't beyond the valley of belief there we go i wanted to get the title right i'm not talking about the jonathan what is it frank's uh franken's or whatever the fucking show this is a, a take on those to kind of make fun of them but i'm not talking actually about that show okay so uh I, I always forget i always shorten things up and then people are like we don't even know what you're talking about now but anyways check out spooky dookie if it sounds like it's up your alley i know what you're looking for i know what you secretly desire i know what you want more than anything right now and you've come to the right place you're sick of all those comic books superhero movies i brought elevated horror Big budget studio films with no heart or soul. That's why I'm here to get you spooky with your dookie. <laughs> spooky dookie. The fine folks at Rock Bottom Videos are bringing you their newest shit show to enjoy this Halloween season. It's like Ernest Scared Stupid on crack. They brought you Gay for Prey, the Big F, Fang Boner, and they want to bring you even more. No inhibitions, no parental supervision. This is cinema at its finest. What the fuck am I doing with my life watching this? And you and anyone who identifies as an adult will ache to admit. Well, technically that was a movie. Spooky Dookie! Spooky Dookie. It's called Spooky Dookie. It's a new film coming out. I feel like you're not even listening. So don't call. Go. Go now. Go see Spooky Dookie. Seriously. Go see it, pervert. Watch me! Watch me! Watch Spooky Dookie! Okay, this is the Patreon pick, and it's from my boy Derek B., and uh, this is pretty funny. He picked On Deadly Ground, uh, starring, um, directed by Steven Seagal, probably produced by him. So, okay, let me get this up straight. You know, when it comes to action heroes, I like most of them. I, I love Arnold. I love Stallone. I love Bruce Willis. I love 
Charles Bronson, if you consider him. I like Dolph Lundgren. I like John claude Van Damme. I like some of the newer ones. Scott Atkins. Don't mind Jason Statham. Like, I like these guys for the most part. You know, and when we get to, like, some of the, uh, the other the people from other countries, I enjoy them as well. But there's a couple that I don't necessarily think are very good. And that's going to be Chuck Norris, who I do like a lot of his movies, though. And I know he doesn't hold his acting in high regard, so I can kind of get over it. And Steven Seagal who a lot of his movies I actually really like because they are always loaded with amazing side characters and character actors to kind of help with his shitty acting. Now, this time, this one was actually directed by Seagal. So while watching, it's like a vanity project at the same time, which has a huge environmental message. But who's going to, you know, try to save the environment and bring this message, you know, full force Steven Seagal's in your face. He's going to tell you how to save the environment. But he's also tough. He's also sensitive, but he's not going to show any of this. I mean, it is exactly kind of what you would expect a vanity, you know, vehicle of Steven Seagal pro environment movie to be. It's 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 a mouthful to say that this movie even fucking exists is insane. So Steven Seagal is, uh, well, it would be Inuit, right? I think that's the proper term. It used to be Eskimo, as a lot of people said. So Inuit or native to Alaska is, I believe, it is Alaska or somewhere around the area. Um. So uh, basically, he lives in this area, and he helps. He works with this oil company ran by Michael Caine, great actor, right? Um, who is this evil billionaire oil company kind of guy who's always having spills and all sorts of shit? And he also has, you know, some lackeys with him. Once being John C. McKinley, one being Sev Thorson from the Arnie films, and uh, I don't know the female actress's name who's his, his lackey, but very typical kind of lawyer in this situation, seemingly. So he has a bunch of lackeys, and a lot of bad things start happening around the place around the oil rigs and, and oil's leaking and their supplies are old and, and if there's going to be somebody that makes a stink, Seagal gets involved with it and a bunch of people end up dead. This is when Seagal decides that he's going to stand up against the evil oil barons. But hey, you know what? Michael Caine has to get this started drilling before a certain time where he's going to lose the land, lose the oil rig, lose billions of dollars. So he's not going to have that. So what's he do? Uh, Steven Seagal and his uh, girlfriend, or not girlfriend, but love interest, I should say, from one of the local tribes is actually, or natives, I should say, is, you know, uh, they're on the run. And and so he's going to hire this badass mercenary group led by Lee Ermey. Also in this mercenary group is an early performance by Billy Bob Thornton. So we have a a slew of actors and actresses that are really fun and well-respected. I can't think of the actress's name. Joey Chin, I think she's Chinese. You've seen her before as well. And uh, Mike Starr is in here. um, And a bunch of other people in bit roles like Michael Jaw White, I think, is a stuntman here. You'll recognize some of the stuntman. Like um, Jeff uh, Amada is in there as a stuntman. And you can tell. like So so all that stuff. All the side characters are great. They're fun. They're entertaining. Um... And even their performances are, are even sometimes unhinged. They're, they're delivering great lines in hilarious ways, even if it is over the top. I mean, they're they're high caliber actors, so they can handle it. I mean, John C. McKinley is, is essentially doing kind of the surviving the game performance he did, where he's just out of breath and screaming. He doesn't have asthma in this one, but he's screaming a lot, and he's complete dickhead. He's very good at that. Um, so so yeah. Anyways, like all the bad guys start getting picked off. He's fighting them. In the he's kind of like a hard target thing at one point, where all these guys are chasing him. And man, Lee. Lee Lee Ermey. Arlie Ermey is a saint, man. There's one point in this movie, it happens a couple times, like Michael Caine does it too, where they'll just have Lee Ermey or Michael Caine give these long, like, ridiculous, like, speeches, and they're like, this guy's so good, and like, just stroking Seagal's ego and hilarity. They're like, he's so good, he'll cut you down a fat half, send half your body to, and race to the body, and then throw it in the lake, and then burn the lake, but it's them, so they're just doing such a good job with it, it's hilarious. Like, I get to see Seagal like, make me seem better, make me seem tougher. And it's just funny. It's ridiculous. But Billy Bob Thornton, he doesn't have very many lines, but he's got a couple and he sticks out, man. You can tell this guy is special. Like there's a, there's a very, very hilarious scene where he's like, uh, should I have my clip in or out? When, you know, he's like, he's like, when we kill this guy, I kind of want to have it in because I don't want to look like a pussy. And it's just, just a stupid, funny shit. Like, and like he was always solid. Like even when he pops up a tombstone or um, one false move, Billy Bob was always a very good and capable and memorable actor. I'm glad he got his break with Sling Blade, and I'm glad he's in bigger movies, you know. So seeing him here is fun, and the action's good. Like, the shootouts are fun, they're gory, Seagal fucks some people up. Like, Seagal can fight, and he's pretty good at that kind of stuff. He just, his dialogue shitty, and he's awkward, and he just can't h- carry a movie, but everyone around him is carrying it so well that I'm just kind of like, this is fun, and you gotta give him some, you know, some points, just for the idea alone of a big Hollywood actor being like, you know what, maybe we should kind of take care of the environment, and I know a lot of people say 
say that, but he's also an action hero. And this is also in the mid nineties. It's not as prevalent, you know, I remember hearing that story on uh, Frank Stallone on, on an on a interview for Savage Harbor said that, what was it, one of the uh, Mitchum kids did one movie with uh, John Wayne and then he mentioned something about uh, keeping the ocean clean or something and John Wayne's like, he's a commie. And it's just like so funny how far, you know, I mean, even, I mean, like, so so that just kind of gives you just kind of a, a little glimpse at, you know, how sometimes masculine men and, and tough guys wouldn't want to, you know, take care of the environment. And, and it for ter- terms of filmmaking back in the day. But I mean, it, it, that was far removed from that time. And it, obviously it's much different now, but regardless, this was a little ahead of its time on, on that kind of stuff, even though we've known about environmental oil spills and all this kind of shit. And it always happens. So uh, it's a good location. Um, Mike Starr's scene is absolutely hilarious and ridiculous. And like, there's such a funny moment where he's like, how long does it take for you to change? And I'm just like, is this fucking happening? Is this happening right now? But on deadly ground would buy a Blu-ray would watch it was entertained by it. Good goon squad. Lots of memorable goons some two to some very one dimensional I will say but they work and they do their job like I said good character actors save and other and action save and otherwise uh poorly poorly kind of a uh, act uh led movie in on deadly ground but hey I liked it I did enjoy it I'm glad I watched it and you know I've watched under siege one and two a bunch of fucking times I always loved those movies good bad guys in those movies as well so there was a time when the Seagal movies were very entertaining regardless of what you felt about his personal performances or not you know what I mean his performances personally you know so it is what it is on deadly ground okay guys let's hop into those 1980 movies they did this to you they're trying to turn us against each other Just look at them. What do they know about friendship, anyway? I'll get them. You watch. I'll take care of those sons of bitches. Watch it, Alan. I'm shooting. Oh, good Lord. It's... It's unbelievable. It's... It's horrible. I can't understand the reason for such cruelty. It must have something to do with some obscure sexual writer. With the almost profound respect these Getting very careless. Blood in your hair. What will we do? You want to look pretty, don't you? Pretty for me. I can't believe you're not afraid. All you have to do is piss on it. Could you care blood, ain't you? God damn it, Ralph, get out of here. Go on, get. Leave people alone. You'll never come back again. Oh, shut up, Ralph. It's got a death curse. Evil. God, my leg. God, my leg. I'm here. You're here. There's a fog bank out there. Messenger of God. Stay here. Demanding everything, including blood. John, I want this material burned. All of it. So he was one ruthless son of a bitch. Wendy, stay away! Darling, light of my life. I'm not gonna hurt you. You didn't let me finish my sentence. I said, I'm not gonna hurt you. I'm just gonna bash your brains. I'm gonna bash him right the fuck in. <laughs> well, Dad, are you proud of me now? Do I measure up? Huh? My son, my son was a son of a bitch, and he was no good. That's it, my son is dead. I don't want to talk about him no more. Oh, see me. Oh, see me. You're gonna die. Elia! Elia! Major Lacrimaro. Ma'am. Major.
Major Tenebrae. We didn't find any boy. Major Suspiriorum. Well, you know as well as I do, it takes all kinds of critters to, to make, make Farmer Vincent fritters. <laughs> I wonder who the real cannibals are. And the first one up, I'm going to be super brief with. This is Witch's Brew. This is a TV movie with Richard Benjamin and some other people, a lot of people I'm not super familiar with. It was the last performance of like a famous actress. I can't remember her name. So this is like a semi-remake of like a book, not a, like an a adaptation of a book that was made into a movie in the 40s. And then that movie was made into Burn Witch Burn, a.k.a. Night of the Eagle, which I've heard about a lot. I know Elric Kane is a big fan of it. He always talked about it on his horror movie podcast. So I was like, oh, this is like more of a comedy spoofy version of it. So essentially we have Richard Benjamin. I don't know exactly he works at the school and his wife it practices witchcraft with a couple other women and uh one day he's like i don't want to do any more of this witchcraft stuff and what it, she says okay fine pulls all the spells that she's been hiding from him and he starts to have a miserable shitty time because these spells were protecting him it turns out like all these women start to kind of pit themselves against each other from my understanding or from like basically the description of what the hell is going on because they're all after the same job some weird shenanigans happen some like gargoyles come out all for the most part this is really too dull to ever get invested in because it's like why is this an hour and 35 minutes i feel like the first 30 minutes is a lot of talking a lot of bickering and i mean if you really like richard benjamin you may enjoy it but for the most part i mean richard benjamin i know uh, from westworld and i know he went on to direct a couple movies as well like my stepmother is an alien so like this movie as a whole is really dull and really boring and i don't have that much to say about it if you're really invested in the first two versions of it you might want to check it out i um need to watch burn which burn I've been meaning to watch that forever, but as far as Witch's Brew is concerned, I would pass on it. I'm definitely never going to watch this movie again unless I get some deluxe Blu-ray and it has a bunch of features on there where I have context that can kind of enlighten me into something worth watching again. Okay, the next one up, not really a horror film, more in the exploitation vein, and not even maybe that. It's it's a... Uh... It is Shogun Assassin, and this is from the Lone Wolf and Cub collection from Criterion. Now, this Shogun Assassin was put out by itself. It is a 1980 um, edit of the first two Lone Wolf and Cub uh, movies, but it was, I think, put in America first. It, it run, ti- run times like 85 minutes, and it has a different soundtrack, more of like a, a, a I guess, a, a synth or like you know more 80s style and it's super fast paced so I've never actually watched the Lone Wolf and Cub movies there are six of them but essentially the plot in Shogun Assassin I definitely wanted to watch it and I guess I was feeling 1980 I want to watch it how the American audience kind of first got to watch it in 1980 I feel like that is cool so essentially what it is is there is it's a period piece and we have a Shogun and he is betrayed by kind of the the you know well, he's not the Shogun. He, he's, he's like a samurai or a Ronin, or I believe. Would it be Ronin? I don't know. He's betrayed by the Shogun. He's the Shogun assassin, so he can't be the Shogun. So essentially, he's betrayed by his boss, the person he's supposed to worship. They, they go to kill him, and uh, they kill his wife. This upsets him greatly, and he decides from that point on, him and his child, um, who's very young at the time, if his child picks the ball, he will die. But if he picks a sword, him and his son will go on this revenge, uh, you know, basically to kill the Shogun. Uh, the kid picks the sword, so basically him and his son travel across different places, and they kill anyone that uh, defies them. He fights for his freedom, but his son does not earn it, so all these bad guys are constantly coming after him. It is nonstop action. There is tons and tons of bad guys always after him. There's a lot of memorable baddies, including a group of female assassins and another group of assassins, and, and three badass, uh, like awesome assassins at the very end that all have these special weapons one of which who has one of the best death scenes in any movie i've ever seen um your technique is amazing that whole scene uh, ridiculous your technique is ridiculous it is beautiful it is an awesome fucking scene i don't want to spoil too much but um they're also he's running into like the shogun's brother the shogun's kids like there's just so many cool elaborate awesome ass fight scenes and what i really love about the fight scenes here like a lot of times you know it's quick like they're just like we square up one fatal mistake and you're done you're out and it feels more legit like how that would happen and you move the wrong way you're done blood spraying everywhere and and where these come from they come from a much earlier time but like seeing how well these are like the, the, the the like 85 minute version of both of these together with that soundtrack is just such a good introductory for me like i just wanted to watch all the lone wolf and cub movies and it like leaves you off like there's way more story to be told and, and just good bad guys good characters good music and it's narrated by the kid 
um, and he says all these amazing things in there. It's just like, um, it is dubbed, so that could bother some people. It's a little hokey, I think, at times for people that aren't used to dubbing, but I, I ate it up. I loved it. I thought it was amazing, and I'm so glad I decided to watch it for 1980. I know it has more of an exploitation appeal, being the two films cut to one and shortened up and everything like that, but a highly recommended Shogun Assassin. I know a lot of people that are familiar with the actual source material more so, probably kind of maybe they stick their nose up to it, and I, I could probably understand that I'll definitely have to watch the Lone Wolf and Cub movies when I get a chance, but Shogun Assassin is amazing. Love it. Okay, going to be very brief with this 1980 movie. And this is The Bloody Lady. And this is a Czechoslovakian story of Elizabeth Bathory, or Bathory, however you want to say it. Basically, Countess Dracula, Countess Blood. She used to bathe in the blood of virgins and young and kind of like poor people to keep her beauty forever. So in the very beginning of this movie, she's kind of portrayed as this wonderful kind of like, would you say Snow White kind of character where she's going in the wilderness. and It's animated, I mind you, if I did not say that already. And the animation is really weird, really childish. Jeremy mentioned that it looked like it was probably from before its time, from the 70s, and kind of just carried over and finished in 1980 or, or something like that. Very choppy, weird style of animation. Very trippy, honestly. It's a short movie. It's 70 minutes, though. So essentially, they show her kind of like a Snow White character where she loves the animals. All the animals come up to her. She has a glorious, beautiful day. And then it rains, and like we see this weird kind of, this strange kind of playful like landscape and all this kind of stuff and animation. And what happens is, basically, she has a love of her life, and her heart is taken out by him she gives him his heart and she becomes horrible and bittered and all this kind of stuff and after that she hates the animals and and through a, a curious case you know a drip of blood falls on her and she realizes it makes her skin beautiful so after that point logically I guess right <laughs> she starts getting virgins and people and her servants obsessed with her and and of course bathing in the blood of servants I love the ending of this I thought the ending was really solid and touching and, and pretty cool and, and it is a true story it is based on a true story although they do have have some of the same beats that stuff like Countess Dracula had, and I don't know how accurate that story is either. Um, it's not as good as the Hammer version, Countess Dracula with Ingrid Pritt. It's not as good as Jorge Grau's Legend of Blood Castle, which also is Elizabeth Bathory's story. So those two come to mind for me. I mean, obviously we have the scene in Hostel 2 that is inspired by, you know, the, the lady who bathed in the virgin's blood. But this is interesting enough to check out. There's barely any dialogue, so no need for subtitles. In the opening, there is some narration, but that's it. Um, and, and I don't understand Czechoslovakian, so I missed about a minute of dialogue. Besides that, there's no real speaking to had, but you can get the story, especially if you're familiar with the other material and the real story. So it is interesting. Um, it's just not that great. Um, the animation is not amazing, but it's a certain style that some people may really like. I think it looks kind of cheap myself, but hey, it is what it is, the bloody lady. Okay, the next one up is going to be Sex and Black Magic, a.k.a. Orgasmo Nero, or Black Orgasm, Orgasm Black, whatever you want to call it. This is from 1-7 Movies, kind of like a bootleg company. This is out of print, and so I watched it online. I know, I know. You can kill me if you'd like. So, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't have that much to say about this one. Um, who's in here? Like, there is a, um, a familiar, a couple familiar people in the film, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Susan Scott is the one that kind of blew my mind. Richard Harrison and, of course, Mark Shannon has a small role in here as well. Now, Susan Scott, uh, a.k.a. Naives Nar Naravo, she was in so many good gialli and classy movies in the 70s. I think she popped up in some Sergio Martino movies. She's in some Western. So I was just like, Susan Scott in this. And this is really pornographic. This is very softcore Joe D'Amato. And this is the third film I've covered for Joe D'Amato for 1980. He also had Anthropophagus, which is pretty good, and Portal Holocaust, which is a little better than this actually if you believe it or not um not yeah yeah it's a porno holocaust <laughs> i can't remember yeah erotic nights of living dead came out the year after if i'm not mistaken joe diamato known as horn porn so I, I what we have here is sex and black magic so um in the beginning we see this ritual performed uh, richard harrison sees it and he kind of studies these people he's there for a reason i can't remember exactly he's kind of a douchebag not a great guy um and he brings his wife along and Susan Scott. She's a little older in this picture. So so it was kind of like set. It kind of took me back when you see her in such very sexual, provocative situations. Because I remember being naked in, in other films, but never as especially ex sexually explicit, you know. So anyways, what happens is uh, Susan Scott falls in love with a native girl whose uh, father had just died. And she has to stick around the camp for the mother. And, and what happens is these two start to kind of take advantage of her in a really kind of disgusting way. And there's like a love triangle. And uh, Richard Harrison is very upset at 
the entire situation and we have numerous uh moments of soft core sex between men and women and women and you know women and like so so it's just like a long like a lot of sex stuff like you know all this kind of stuff it's not exactly great it's not exactly eventful and it's kind of wore out i mean wears out its welcome and it also is pretty outdated because nowadays we have so many of these different things but i do like susan scott and um, I know a lot of people, you're not saying her real name. Hey, it's easier for me to say, please forgive me. But I, I do like her and I do like her performance. And the ending, I think, is just desserts. And I kind of like the ending as well. Um, not a perfect movie, more of a porno, a softcore porno listed as a horror film. I know it does have the kind of supernatural kind of like native kind of superstitious stuff in there. It feels like it's probably shot at the same island as Porno Holocaust. Who knows? I don't know. Um, but it does seem like it is a little bit, I don't know. I'd say more big a bigger budget it, it, it's kind of in that line but it feels a little different than those other two I, I don't know Joe D'Amato is a busy guy this is his least of the three he put out this year I'm sure he probably put out five other movies this year that are maybe porn or more porn oriented than horror but this is Sex and Black Magic Orgasmo Nero it is what it is. It's exactly what you kind of think it is, but a lot less horror than you might think it is as well. Okay, this one here is kind of an interesting film. This is Escape from Hell. Now, uh, yeah, this one right here was originally released by Troma, and it, it was cut up. This is 1980, of course. This was cut up and used in the 1985 movie, Savage, uh, what the fuck is it? The one with Linda Blair, Savage Escape, or some shit like that that Full Moon put out. And I covered that for 1985, and they used footage from Escape from Hell in you know, that movie. It's like they completed this movie with that. Um, that movie is not that good. It's not a very good movie, but it does share some same cast members because they obviously lifted some stuff here. Escape from Hell is basically um, a woman in prison movie in kind of like the jungle area. So Anita uh, Wilson is in here. She's for familiar face, but also we have Anthony Steffen, who is famous for a lot of spaghetti westerns, including Django, uh, You Live, You Bastard. What is that one called? By Sergio Garoni, if I'm not mistaken. He's in a slew of movies. Anthony Ant Anthony Steffen's in a lot of films. You'd recognize him right away. He's kind of got those cold, dead eyes. Also, also Luciani Pigazzi is in here. I hope I said Luciano, Luci, Luci, whatever. Pigazzi's in here. He's basically, you know, Italy's answer to uh, Peter Lorre. And he's much older in this than he was in Blood and Black Lace, which me and Jeremy will talk about a little later in this video. So he, uh, what we have is Anthony Steffen is a drunk doctor who works in this prison camp. He, there's two ruthless goons, that three, including the woman guard. Of course, you got to have have that um so there's like three ruthless guards and there's a bunch of other guards but then the new warden shows up and it's a, you know it's Pagazzi and he's really ruthless and disgusting he's a germaphobe so we follow the story of these women being beat and raped and, and it's pretty pretty brutally raped there's one scene where uh they turn the girl over and it's just like wow i can't believe they're doing that this is pretty brutal a uh, scene not as graphic as the one in contraband but it is kind of reminiscent of the one in contraband from 1980 involving you know a rape so you guys get what i'm at. There's a lot of nudity. Um, everybody's sweaty. Everybody's gross. And it's funny how much of a lambido almost everybody has in this movie, considering the fact that they're covered in sweat and they're covered in gross things. They're, they're mud. And just you can imagine the rank smell of everyone and just everybody's get to get down to rape or have sex with someone. And I'm just like, man, you guys is lambido. That jungle, whatever you guys are getting in the jungle is got to be magic. So it, it, it's just like a, a grungy, dirty movie. And eventually there's a, a big escape where a lot of people get shot. A lot of people die at the, the end, falling in quicksand and adventure movie style, although it's very brutal. Remember when adventure movies in like the early 80s, late 70s were just ungodly brutal? I mean, because technically a lot of those cannibal movies from like the, uh, the, the 80s and stuff and the 70s were just like adventure movies. It's like, like, well, it's an adventure movie and somebody's getting their, their dick chopped off and they're getting eaten by a, a you know a piranha and it's just like adventure and now it's just like there's so much more wholesome in comparison but anyways Escape from Hell it's okay it's a lot better than expected you know the quality looks like shit but it's not even close to the worst one I watched for 1980 I liked it I'd give it like a 3 out of 5 it's, it's a pretty run of the mill prison movie but it's brutal it's sleazy um and, you know, the dubbing's not great, but hey, uh, you guys kind of expect it. I like Anthony Steffen. I like Pagazzi, so that's a plus. Anyways, Escape from Hell. Here's another rewatch, one I actually covered on the show, so I'll be kind of brief with this. And this is the unauthorized sequel to Patrick, the Australian movie. This is Patrick Still Lives, an Italian sequel, unauthorized sequel. You know, they're great at that. So Patrick Still Lives is an absolute weird, bonkers movie. Remember in Clue, when all those people are invited to the house and then people start getting picked off? Imagine if it was Patrick-style 
where like there was this kind of person that was in in bed, you know, like kind of brain dead, you think, or basically comatose. They cannot move. Their eyes are just open and they're kind of just like killing people with their telekinesis. This is like so weird. So five or six, I think it's six people are invited to this villa to hang out. They're all like rich, upper crust, sleazy pieces of crap. A lot of them are going to get nude. A lot of them are going to have sex. A lot of them are going to flaunt what they have. A lot of them are going to get drunk and argue and fight. But all of them are going to be killed with some weird kind of telekinetic shit. Um, so that's basically the run of the mill of Patrick still lives. There's going to be some infighting amongst, you know, the people who are pulling the strings in this whole giant experiment. There is a lot of nudity, a lot of sleaze, a lot of decent deaths as well. A lot of horrible men, a lot of horrible men slapping women and just the women aren't great people either, but the men seem to be particularly shitty. Um, yeah, Patrick still lives is low budget. It's cheap. It's fun. The music's cool. It's, it's gross. It's an overall solid kind of goofy Italian unauthorized sequel that kind of knows no shame. That's Patrick still lives. I've talked about this before, so I'll keep it brief. I'll keep it, I'll keep it, uh, you know, nice and short, but we do have an interview with, uh, actor Giannani D, who played Patrick's, and I think he passed recently, but anyways, maybe I'm wrong about that, he did, uh, you know, a theme hit song or something like that, and, and that's kind of interesting as well, so if you like Patrick Still Lives, pick it up from Severn films. Okay, the next one up is a heavy hitter from 1980, and I'm not going to talk about it in depth. Me and Jeremy covered this one before, and it's the Brian De Palma movie, Dressed to Kill. So this is kind of like Brian De Palma's take on Psycho, right? And and other Hitchcock films as well. This has a great cast. Nancy Allen, Keith Gordon, Dennis, uh, um, geez, Dennis Franz, and of course Michael Caine. Michael Caine is in this bad boy. Who is the actress in the Angie Dickinson? She's phenomenal in this. So we got a really good cast here. I like all those people. I think they always do a really good job. Speaking of Michael Caine was just in On Deadly Ground. This is a much classier movie than On Deadly Ground, although a lot of it is kind of dated. And I will say that, you know, a lot of the subject matter could upset some people. And it's one of these ones, you know, we're talking about 1980. We're talking about horror. We're talking about exploitation. But this movie has a certain amount of prestige about it. You know, it's very approachable. It's Brian De Palma. He's very respected and has a great great cast and it's really well made so the subject matter you know that could bother people is more likely to get to a wider audience so you know it, it takes a special kind of person to pop in cannibal holocaust or house on the edge of the park or you know primitives and, and be offended by it you know you kind of know exactly what you're getting into at that point in society or just looking at the cover and reading the back and seeing the day but dress to kill you know had a breakthrough you know to a bigger audience and everything like that so essentially what we have here is angie dickinson is kind of having an uh you know she's in a loveless marriage or a sexless marriage I should say it's not sex list but it's not sex is not great and of course she has a one night stand with someone and she's promptly murdered you know she she kind of it, it like tells a lot of this to her psychiatrist and Michael Caine and her son is Keith Gordon, who's a young kind of computer kind of tech whiz. And uh, the witness of the murder, uh, it's one of the best scenes, best constructed scenes in 1980 in the elevator. It's just a beautifully edited and shot scene and gives you genuine chills. One of the scariest scenes of the year for sure. Uh, um, basically, Nancy Allen is a high class prostitute that witnesses the whole thing. And Nancy Allen, man, is an underrated actress. She is so good in absolutely everything she was in from Carrie to Dress to Kill to RoboCop. I I've never been disappointed by Nancy Allen's performances. I've always thought she was tremendous and I've always thought she was completely underrated. And, you know, I wish she was in every movie because once I think about it, I, I've been a little bit shitty, I think, with like, you know, talking about some favorite actresses. But push come to shove, I'm sitting here. I'm like, Nancy Allen has always done a great job. You know, I think that Nancy Allen is top. She's great in this, too. She's the best character. Um, so um, we, I don't want to spoil the twist here or anything like that if nobody's ever seen it. But like I told you, it is very heavily inspired by Psycho, and uh, the performances are, are wild on that end, I'll say that. Um, Keith Gordon is good, too. Also an actor that I think I wish had a longer career as far as acting is concerned. I know he directs films. Dennis France is absolutely a cartoon in this, but the best kind of cartoon, that kind of tough cop was like, I'm gonna bust your balls! I love it. I live for that shit. Um, and the whole movie has a hazy dreamlike quality about it on there, especially, and it, it kind of works, too, because the film opens up in like some sort of dream, and it kind of closes with like a dream kind of quality, too. Um, it is a bizarre film. 
Um, there's not that many murders in there, but what's in there is really effective. It is a giallo. It's an American giallo. It's a thriller. And uh, like Duncan and me talked about when we talked about Cruising, which was a video that will come out. It's one of those 19 year horror year 1980 videos that's going to come out probably hopefully shortly, hopefully before this since I name dropped it. But we talked about how funny it is that, you know, we're looking at 1980 and we have Maniac Cruising and Dressed to Kill. And like Cruising has parts of Maniac and Dressed to Kill in it. But do no parts is Dressed to Kill and Maniac ever cross you know what i mean they do not feel like they belong in the same universe although you know cruising is like that centerpiece that feels like it connects all of them anyways um i uh, dress to kill is a really great movie um it, it's one that is more approachable for a wider a wider audience i think but at the same time i think some of the stuff in there the subject matter you know being dated and stuff could rub people the wrong way and i i'm giving a warning on dress to kill but i'm not giving a warning when we talk about cannibal holocaust it's just funny i'm just saying it's just the difference like i said people kind of know what to expect with cannibal holocaust people might not know what to expect with dress to kill although they should as well you know the criterion uh, dvd i meant blu-ray i think there's a 4k coming soon from kino if it's not out already has features of course here um new conversation between de palma and filmmaker noah bomb uh Bumbach. new interviews with actress nancy allen producer greg Leto, composer pino Dinaggio, who's a fucking beast um sha what are we going um Shower scene body double, Victoria Lynn Johnson. Yeah, of course, that's a body double. There's a lot of nudity and sex in here. And poster for... Uh Photographic art director Stephen uh, Sandinian, The Making of Dress to Kill, a 2001 documentary, new profile cinematographer Ralph Bod, featuring filmmaker Michael Apid, interview with actor director Keith Gordon from 2001, pieces from 2001 uh, about the different versions of the film and the cuts made to avoid an axe, gallery of storyboards by De Palma, plus an essay and a trailer, all that good stuff. So obviously, if you haven't seen Dress to Kill, I recommend it. Um, I'm sure it will make most people's top 25 when we do 1980 on 22 Shots of Moots and Horror. Okay, the next one up is something I've already talked about before. But this is the ninth configuration, or Screen Factory will lead you to believe the ninth coin figuration. But I prefer the title Twinkle Twinkle Killer Kane. And this is more of an exploitation, but I think it's more of a drama. But it does have, I guess, some aspects that people consider horror um, in here, you know, existential stuff. It is listed as a horror film on Letterboxd. I don't know if I agree with that. But this movie is directed by William Peter Blatty, who um, wrote The Exorcist. He also directed Exorcist 3. Two for two. Both movies, I think, are great. Um, obviously, wrote a great one as well well that uh, William Friedkin kind of made into a movie and uh, he was never exactly happy with the outcome of that movie but I think that he thinks it's a great movie I mean who would he obviously passed recently I'm, I'm his thoughts on all these movies and stuff is well documented interesting guy he actually is in this one as well so this basically follows the story of a, a bunch of soldiers and other people and an astronaut who's a marine and Scott Wilson who are all sent to this like castle in Europe to kind of yeah be re be reevaluated because they've all suffered mental breaks and people aren't sure if they're fake it. Stacey Keach is a new doctor that comes in. He's brought in by Ed Flanders, um, who's a great actor. And, and basically, it's just a slew of character actor heaven here. I mean, it's a character actor heaven here. You have Jason Miller, who's absolutely hilarious in here. Robert Leosia, Moses Gunn, Joe Spinell. Who else am I forgetting? Tom Atkins. Um, Neville Brand is fucking awesome in this movie. Now, Neville Brand and Tom Atkins are actually soldiers, but Stacey Keach is the main doctor. And Stacey Keach, I think, is an excellent actor. He's never disappointed me from you know from if he's in something silly like body bags all the way to something silly like Titus or or American History X being serious and creepy or, or these ones these old films he's just a I like Stacy Keach he's good he's a good actor very solid never disappointing always good and he's great in this He's magical in this. Everybody's magical in this. Scott Wilson's really solid in this. And this is a bizarre film that starts off really more of an absurdist, like Candied or something, and silly and funny. But in the very beginning, it has that song saying that tone, and it sets the tone to be really kind of depressing and sad. But then we get there, and we meet all the patients, and they're just being really weird and goofy and silly and funny and and crazy. Like, And then as it goes on, we start to get into the more in-depth about, you know, existential stuff and religion and philosophy. And we just have all these mind-bending ideas and people saying all these things and dealing with things. And, you know, William Peter Blatty was an interesting guy. He was a religious guy, but he questioned these things. He brought these things up in his his works and and they they come across in this as well. But uh, there is an infamous, you know, bar fight or bar massacre, I will say, involving Richard Lynch, who's one of the greatest villains of all time from stuff like, you know, Invasion USA and Bad Dreams and Rob Zombie's Halloween everybody's favorite movie but so he's in here and some other familiar faces I I believe the other biker in there is a familiar guy as well but it's a great bar scene 
And a movie about sacrifice and, you know, a, mo- a religious movie that I can get behind, The Ninth Configuration. So I, I love where it's filmed. Uh, the much better movie with a great cast uh, with, uh, that's considered kind of a cult movie in a castle, much better than The Keep. The, I'm hating on The Keep here, guys. I know people like it and I want to like it. I just can't get into The Keep. But uh, the acting, the dialogue, the messages, all this kind of stuff brought in is just it's wonderfully done. And it keeps it with a set of uh, humor and sadness. I Like I always say, if they can make you laugh, they can make you cry. And Ed Flanders scene where he's talking to Stacey. Keach and he knows something that no you know no one else knows but on second watch you know it as well and he goes out in the hallway and he's breaking up it's just like some really great moments and and the one reveal is just it's it's a mind fuck it's such a mind fuck i really like this movie i think it's a great film i don't know if i consider it a horror at all it's listed, so I rewatched it, and I'm never going to not rewatch this one if it's listed. I was like, fuck it, I'm going to watch Night Configuration. Now, if we're, we're including some exploitation films, it definitely might include in the bottom part of my 25, just because it's such a good film and it has maybe the exploitation flair. I'm not 100% sure. Anyways, The Night Configuration is a great film if you've not seen it, um, and the title Twinker. Twinkle Twinkle Killer Kane is cool. Um, Scott Wilson is an actor that just kind of underutilized in life in general. I feel like he always did a good job from Behind the Mask to Rise of Leslie Vernon to... I know he was in a couple action movies and in kind of a lesser role, but i never seen Scott Wilson do a bad job. You know, he's good in this and interesting in this as well as the astronaut. But Stacey Keach, I think, steals the show. Jason Miller and, and, and steals the show. And this is one of five movies that Joe Spinell did this year. And, I mean, what a killer year for Spinell. Maniac, Cruisin', Ninth Configuration. What are the other ones in here? Forbidden Zone. And uh, the first of the deadly with the one with Sinatra. I think he's in that as well. I'll have to watch that. It's more of a thriller. But still, five for Spinell, man. Spinell was on a roll. Uh, Giovanni Redi- Lombardo Redici had three movies. Del, uh, Diodato directed to, Ritz Ortolani scored to. We have a lot of people. Jamie Lee Curtis was in a couple. We have a lot of people doing a lot of things in 1980. More than one thing. LaFulci directed to. So, yeah, it's just anyways, check out the ninth configuration. I think you'll dig it. If you don't, I, hey, it is. I don't know why. I mean, it's a bizarre movie. You might not like it. I think it's interesting enough that everybody should see it once. Okay, the next one up. Let's be a little brief with this. This is a Vinegar Syndrome release of The Children. And it was distributed by Troma originally. It's not a Troma movie, I don't believe. So, I covered this already and the children it has like a regional quality about it so essentially the plot of the children is a school bus of kids um because a couple lazy bastards working at a nuclear power plant don't want to do their job hey that's a similar to hell of the living dead from 1980 right a couple fuck-ups at a nuclear power plant um so essentially they don't want to do their job and they leave early or they don't check something right and this nuclear kind of gross you know fog hits the school bus on the way home and uh after that all the kids kind of don't come home from school and we follow the sheriff who's going around trying to figure out what the hell's happened. He found an abandoned bus, no bus driver, no kids. And all the kids have been infected with this radiation. And all the kids touch people. They have these black fingernails. It kind of eviscerates them. They, they melt them. They boil them. They, they make them really nasty and gross. So they go home to their parents, and naturally their parents want to touch their kids, give them a hug. And a lot of times before the parents even realize it's too late, they are done. They are boiled. So basically it is up to a sheriff, the deputy, and you know one of the parents to try to figure out what the hell's going on in this situation and stop the kids. The way to kill the kids is whop, whop off their hands and then they kind of just... Anyways, the kids do play tricks on here. It's a fun siege kind of part at certain points. It has a good regional quality about it. The music is by Manfredini. Um, who did Friday the 13th, and I don't have to tell you that if you hear the score, you're like, that's kind of like very much like a Friday the 13th score, no doubt. Um, it's a cool movie. It's a fun movie. It's a low-budget movie. It's a low-budget movie done right. Mean-spirited. Actually pretty dark. It fits with the mold of 1980, that nihilism that's still going on where a lot of people are just having downbeat sad endings and everything like that. I think it's a good flick. I enjoy it uh, much more this time around than I did the first time, but The Children uh, from Vinegar Syndrome, it does have a commentary and making of and stuff, and I really was... The commentary doesn't really Really add much i would just watch the other features on here as well you know before that because like I, I feel like i watched two i feel like there's two special supplemental stuff in here and they both just repeated each other so watch one or the other i guess all right the last one from 1980 is also a rewatch, and this is from vinegar syndrome this is beyond evil by herb freed who did graduation day if i'm not mistaken i know he did a couple other movies so be beyond evil not beware evil i'm sorry uh, there's beware children that play from them and then there's you know beware brethren from vinegar syndrome that's why i'm getting confused it is beyond evil that's right so this has john saxon in it and linda day george 
Linda Day George married to Christopher George from, you know, a couple movies uh, that I love, including Exterminator and City of the Living Dead. Linda Day George pops up in a bunch of his movies as well together, and they always have good chemistry. I like seeing them together. So um, this also has John Saxon, and John Saxon's other movie this year was Cannibal Apocalypse. I love Cannibal Apocalypse. Love John Saxon. John Saxon is famous and for Ender the Dragon, Nightmare on Elm Street, the typical kind of movies, right? We know John Saxon. So John Saxon is an architect. He's uh, called in by his buddy. His buddy says, hey, I need you to help me get this building up AI. AP. It's in this uh, kind of a, uh, you know, I think it's Mexican. Is it Mexican South American uh, town? So he goes down there with his new wife and Linda Day George, who was previously married to his buddy uh, Del Giorgio. And Del Giorgio is like, hey, I. I Told you I was going to set you up with an apartment. I didn't do that. I got you one better. I got you a house. This house has an ancient curse on it, of course. The, all the people and the, the villagers and everybody that lives here does not go there. They tell you it's cursed. They tell you it's evil. And essentially what happened was some weird messed up love story happened here. Not a love story. Anti-love story. The antithesis of love story. Um, a couple were forced to marry and they hated each other. And the guy betrayed her. And now she is very jaded and very hateful. She decides to take over the body of Linda Day George and start to possess her. Of course, weird things start to happen at the work site. People that kind of start to realize she is getting sick or she is getting messed up, start to die in mysterious, supernatural, telekinetic ways, right? I think Patrick still lives kind of, right? So that kind of starts happening here. Kind of typical in the vein there. Um, my favorite parts all involve John Saxon. His freak out at the hospital is amazing. He's like, can anybody get out of this shit all alive? And an orderly touches him and John Saxon, perfect form, goes in. Bop! Lands that book gut shot. Love it. And uh, he just walks away pissed off. Favorite part in the whole movie. I know it's not much to speak of. It is a very average horror film, maybe a, a three out of five at mo at best, you know, it, it's not horrible. It has a couple of kills in here. Um, it, it's very, very standard, but very, I mentioned very much of the run of the mill, but not bad, not offensive. I enjoy it. This is the second time watch rewatching it. And there's a lot worse things to watch. This one is pretty satisfactory. I do like it. I do love John Saxon though. And Linda Day George is fine as well. It's an all right 1980 horror film. Um, one of the more like rare kind of run of the mill kind of standard, not too, um, violent or mean spirited. It's kind of standard, really kind of almost lighthearted in comparison to a lot of the shit we've been talking about. Although there is a decent amount of kill counts and there's a couple of people you don't expect to die and they just don't really seem to give a shit when they do, but that is, uh, beyond evil. Check it out. It sounds like it's up your alley. All right, guys, we're here for You Ain't Seen, and this is my pick for Jeremy, and I picked uh, Mario Bava's Blood and Black Lace. Well, I gave you a choice between two Bava movies, that and Bay of Blood, which we will watch eventually. I've seen the, both of them, of course, and Blood and Black Lace, I feel like, is one of Bava's most respected movies. I think that it's one that gets a lot of credit for, you know, the, the wonderful color palette he used, inspired, you know... Uh, Argento, Suspiria, all these kind of things. Um, I'm pretty sure everybody watching this channel knows that Mario Bava is pretty much like the king Italian horror director. He's considered, you know, one of the big three, I would say, along with Fulci and Argento, but he was, you know, the, the predecessor to both of them. Uh, they're both inspired by him. They both worked with him. And uh, he's a uh, jack of all trades. You know, I think he's a master of all trades in reality. He started off, you know, working on other films, cinematography, magic tricks. He was very good at doing a lot of, like, magic within the camera. And then eventually he got a break co-directing Kaltiki, the Immortal Monster, which is kind of like a blob-type rip-off deal. And it's a really cool movie. And after that, I guess there was no turning back. He worked on dozens of movies from Fantasy, Sword and Sandal, all the way up until horror films. Uh, and Blood and Black Lace is considered one of the earliest giallos, or gialli, however you want to put it. I don't know. There, I mean, doing that kind of argument, there was Krimis, which were the you know the German ones like that. And then uh, also, as people say, the girl who knew too much, the uh, Mario Bava movie would be considered the one, Evil Eye. But this one, it has like the bright colors and stuff. It would be more the precursor to the ones that people would say Argiallo's, the ones that inspired kind of Argento, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So Argento does get a lot of the credit, as he should, but Mario Bava is really kind of the guy behind it. So this one has all the kind of like typical things you see in these these Giallo's that came after. You have, you know, the high fashion, the rich people, the greed, the, I guess, the murdering to cover your tracks and this kind of thing. The, you know, elaborate cinematography that's done to save money, but it looks so elegant. It's kind of uh, very impressive. The lighting. And not all giallos have this kind of cool shit in there, the lighting and stuff and the techniques. And it has really 
brutal murders, which are which are kind of shocking for the time, to be honest. Um, no, no, he's no stranger to that with Black Sunday, which we've seen, which is probably one of the right. glorious early movies. So, uh, yeah, essentially, um, a woman is murdered, and police detectives come in, and they basically blame everyone's a suspect, you know, all the way from Cameron Mitchell, who worked with Baba a couple times, to uh, Pigazzi, who is in another movie this week that I watched, uh, very different from Blood and Black Lace, and a couple other familiar faces. And, yeah, it's up to you to figure out who the murder is what are the twists all that good stuff so what'd you think on a first impression oh it's pretty good <laughs> pretty good after pretty good. all that introduction so <laughs> you gotta remember taking in context this is it's it's excellent and and this is before like a steady cam you know this is before you could walk with the camera this is literally somebody doing all this kind of elaborate stuff even the opening credits are, are painted perfectly they have everybody just standing there like models like mannequins which you see all the mannequins in the movie as well and the brightly mm -hmm. lit colors it's a it's on godly beautifully lit the, I 63 like the, uh, 64 it's amazing oh yeah yeah i mean, I mean the, the color is amazing like all the scenes are amazing um and again it does revolve around kind of like 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 a fashion world yeah. I, I do. I did like the way that they handled the opening credits, where they introduced like each character <laughs> in like a pose of like a yeah. mannequin or something. Um, it was a good way to at least introduce the cast. I probably would like to see their names too, because I think that helps. Yeah. Well, they're probably different names in the American oh, and the more Italian of dub. Yeah. Um, no, I mean it, it was it was pretty good. It, it was uh, you know. You had seen it before, but it's because there's you, you, movies I that mean, kind of lift from it. Yeah, yeah, but which doesn't make it necessarily a bad no. thing. It's that that is kind of the downfall for Bava for a lot of people. When I originally saw Black Sabbath, which is the anthology he did, mm -hmm. I felt like some of the stories I had seen done before, you know, in that kind of style, and not exactly verbatim. And I'd have a lot more respect for it now, but it just felt like it's. It, I don't want to say old trick, but it wasn't. But it felt a little bit. This one never does to me. I think this one is such a, uh, you know, elegant, gorgeous looking movie that it doesn't matter. Oh, yeah, I, yeah it doesn't matter. And, you know, it's, you know, why, why complain about a simple story? It's not necessarily about the story being told. Um, it's nice to watch a movie that looks like a Argento movie, but you can actually follow it because <laughs> it has a coherent plot. Um, you know, so that's always a plus is... Yeah, okay, so maybe Argento learned, you know, all of his camera tricks from Bava, but, um, you know, maybe not so much his storytelling ability. And Bava had a lot more money. You know, this is mm. style over substance, but there is a story there, an easy-to-follow story yeah. and, and stuff like that. The diary is a great little tech thing about this. Basically, so many mm. people are killed for a diary. If the police would have done their job properly, police are kind of shitty. There's like three or four people dead before they even stop and do anything, really. Um, mm -hmm. I, I like all the characters, the infighting and all this kind of stuff. Uh, Cameron Mitchell's great. Unfortunately, he doesn't get to dub his own voice. It's definitely not his voice. Uh, Mitchell's got a great look, and he would be in a couple Baba movies and, and bigger movies before this, but I always knew him from his horror output, which I love. You know, I, I mentioned that you didn't know who he was, and I found that funny. Did you recognize him in this? Ooh. You never, Cameron Mitchell, do you know, still not know who he is? Isn't he like in Baywatch or something. What is wrong with you? He would never be in Baywatch. He I would be know. in Baywatch. That's David Hasselhoff, <laughs> who actually had a stint in Italian films as well. Um, most uh, the, the big one was what? Um, Witchery with Linda Blair. Isn't Cameron Mitchell in The Thing? No, that's Wilford Brimley. Oh. What is wrong with you? I don't know who Cameron Mitchell is. You're he a gets, disgusting he, he was talking. He was saying like it's Cameron Mitchell, like, like it's like, you know, the most... It should be. Any self-respecting genre fan. I'm not a genre fan. Get out. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, I, I really like the film, and I like the twist. And it's got some just desserts at the very end, which are lovely. Um, you know, it, it's gothic, which is strange, because it, it's a story about, you know, murder and inheritance, which makes it gothic. But mm -hmm. it has also a, the, the kind of chilling, like, old-school gothic, beautiful castle kind of stuff going on. Mm -hmm. And there's a count and all this kind of shit. So um, the murders are, like I said, brutal. Way more brutal than you'd expect. Like, people getting burned and the drowning and stuff. And when that girl gets drowned, like, she actively looks like a painted doll. She mm -hmm. looks like a mannequin, which is perfect, again, because we have the models and the dresses and the mannequins and the high fashion and there's so many movies like this you know i mean that, that take that you know strip nude for your killer has that ordeal i just mean there's so many that involve the high fashion like the high class beautiful things and being murdered you know mm -hmm. uh yeah like i said i don't have too much more to say about it except i think it's an exceptional movie i think it's ahead of its time and i think it's very important i would give it nine uh, four out of five yeah so do you want to read the books? No. Yes, we're reading the Why books. Why would I have to read the books? Okay, 
John Stanley's Creature Features. Let's go. Um, I just use let's go. I hate that term. People are not let's go. That's the lamest thing ever. If you, if you say that, like, unironically, like, when you're hype, I fucking mm-hmm. stop it. Blood and Black Lace. Three out of five. Italian-French horror thriller focuses on a fiendish killer and the step-by-step enactment of crimes against beautiful models in a fashion salon run by Eva Bartok. In a compelling script by Marvello Fondato, Mario Bava, and Giuseppe Barella, the killer wears a stocking a mask of the face, an empty blank. And there's a merciless choice on the on the director Bava's part to show gore murders and drawn out excruciating sequences. One woman has her face shoved against a hot grill. For example, one time cinematographer Bava uses primary colors to psychological effect, creating the paradox of beautiful looking movie about death, AKA fashion house of death and six women for the murder. Cameron Mitchell, Thomas Renner, Harriet White. I should mention that uh, the killer looks fucking awesome. And Dick Tracy, the blank is just that killer. Um, they didn't mention it. They didn't mention him being Dick Tracy. <laughs> no, but I did. I, I am mentioning Oh, then mention it. Also, uh, some other things in here, you know, um, eat your heart out, uh, Herschel Gordon Lewis. I know everybody's like, he's the Gore King. It's just like, yeah, but if they're, if they're shoddy scenes, they're shoddy scenes. These are brutal. Yeah, okay. I got this book. James O'Neill, Tear on Tape. Tear on tape. There is an audio version of this, so the poor sap's listening. So this is out of four. Oh, we're done reading this. It will be an audio version. Uh, oh, he gives us a three and a half. Yeah. Smart man. 1964, Blood and Black Lace. Baba's seminal stalker movie about a stable of glor- glamorous fashion models haunted by a masked maniac after the inflammatory diary of his first victim. Baba's neon colored atmosphere paved the way for the lush cosmopolitan thrillers of Dario Argento <laughs> and his violence, which. Though not overly gory, it's still pretty strong stuff. One girl is severely burned against a red-hot heater, while another is smashed in the face with a spiked glove that would give Freddy Krueger pause. Only the poor dubbing, all the males including Star Mitchell, are voiced by the familiar tones of Paul Free, (laughs) detracts from the overall effect, a.k.a. the titles that he listed. I almost brought up Paul Freeze when we were talking about The Legend of Sinbad because you brought up the other guy. And I oh, was yeah. like, I was thinking, who's the other guy? He did all the voices back in the day. It's Paul Freeze. He's just oh, talk, okay, talking okay. to himself back and forth. Uh, Joe Dante always made that joke. He's like, Paul Freeze would just have dialogue with himself in all those dumb movies. Like, <laughs> so, yeah, like I, the dubbing's pretty poor for this one, I think. And it's mostly the males. I, I love the female lead, too, Bartok. She's oh, I, think, great. I think she's fantastic. And, and, and like I said, Mitchell does good, even mm-hmm. if he's dubbed. The least sweaty Cameron Mitchell ever was. Um, yeah, like I said, um, it, it's great stuff. If, you, if you've never seen it, I highly recommend checking it out. It's a must. It, it, it's, I think, one of the first stops on the Jello um, or Italian horror film kind of run. It, it's got to be in your first ten ones you watch. You know, if you're watching mm-hmm. Italian horror, first ten. If you're watching Italian Jolly, Italian Jolly, all the all the Jolly are Italian. First five. So yeah, great stuff. What do you think? What are we watching next week? Oh, um, oh, I wanted to do. I think it's called The Mystic, 1925. I guess that's what we're doing. We'll have to find it. It's a silent movie, right? Yeah. I think, I think okay, we'll silent. find it. And if we can't find it... But we'll... the costumes look cool. If we can't find it, I'll, I'll pull up a cartoon or something. No I'll, I'll more cartoons. <laughs> right. We'll watch uh, Blood and Lace. What about uh, Arsenic and... I'm just kidding. We Blood already Lace. watched Arsenic and Lace. We'll watch Bay of Blood. Well, we'll watch it again. I'm just kidding. We're out of here. All right, guys, let's do these questions and answers. Last week, I basically asked you your favorite Blu-ray 4K DVD release of the year. So, uh, Petre Lambella. Thank you so much for watching Let's Scare Jessica to Death. I'm happy that you liked it. It's one of the very few movies that has managed to genuinely scare me as an adult. The atmosphere is just perfect. I found the movie at the same time I found Messiah of Evil and Soul Survivor, and I remember being almost overwhelmed by these three creepy movies that I probably hadn't even heard of before. I never tell anyone it's a vampire movie because I think it kind of spoils it a little bit. And also, don't even know if it is a vampire movie, really. I'd say it's more a psychological horror film because we really don't know how much of a story was just in the main character's head. This is one of the few cases where I disliked the original poster art so much that I opted for another release instead of the Screen Factory one. I've always wondered if I could have been it could have been a bigger success with a different title and cover art. RB, Jamie Wolfitz was fantastic as a Schofield kid. I can't uh, see anyone else playing that role. Great show as usual. Dave, thank you. Uh, Travis Ziscom, I hope I win. I wanted to ask you where I get the movie, so here's my chance. If you want Slimy Little Bastards on Blu-ray, ToxicFilth.com. Um, basically, he mentions he was the guy in Letterbox who he had a great comment. He mentioned something about nothing quite like po- American post uh, per- uh, Nightmare, Night of Living Dead pre uh, 
Texas Chainsaw Massacre Horror, and he basically gave me his Patreon pick, Hot Snakes. Uh, Donald Farmer, um, his favorite release was Flash for Frankenstein from Vinegar Syndrome. James D. Koch, Second Sight, Session 9. Carl Butcher Yacht, August Underground, coming from August uh, from Honor Films, not out yet. Christopher Webb, Human Lanterns by 88 Films, cool release. Jason Fetter, Stanley and Horror High from Vinegar Syndrome. I saw Horror High on TV at 6 and ran out of the screaming out of the house. It's really tame these days. Uh, Yarno Harganen, Blue Hawaii, Elvis in 4K. Uh -huh. Nick Mua, favorite home movie media release 88 film species box set excellent release especially the new batch of commentaries with kim newman being the top one question one which film do you dislike enough to say that's a waste of the blu-ray medium i don't really know like my opinion I, like shouldn't all movies should get a release i'm sure there's an audience for all movies but i'm sure there's movies that i can't stand that i'm never going to watch um any of the movies that are made without a heart and soul that's that are just not entertaining those um Two, did you catch any Eli Roth's history of horror? If yes, care to give your opinion? I saw some of it. You know, I put it on in the background and listened to like a lot of the interviews, the extended interviews, and I enjoy that. I enjoy hearing other filmmakers talk about other filmmakers' work, you know, get their opinions and see things that I don't see. Um, and three, uh, colorophobia, a typical U.S. phenomenon. I'm not sure what you're referencing to there. Is is it all Stephen King's fault? Um, Jeremy seems to disdain Mr. King's oeuvre. oeuvre. Feel free to discuss it with him. No, he, we've talked a lot about it. Many sunny greetings from Turkey Sensei Parker. Glad I was able to do my homework as per usual. Have fun. Emily Duran, Death Game from Grindhouse Releasing. Michael LeBlanc, Second Sight's The Witch, one of the best 4K trances I've ever seen. Much better than North American 4K release. Yeah, I wasn't impressed with American. I'll have to get the, the import. Cassidy bought one. Synapse Tenebrae 4K. Love it. Lacey Lou, I haven't even gotten yet, but Scream 2. 100% Scream 2, Brandon Young. It's on route now, right now. I'm very excited for the Martyrs copy of From Umbrella. Me too, I should have got that. Terrence Cover, Voyage of the Rock Aliens. Herbert West, Creature from Black Lake from Synapse Films. Scared the hell out of me as a kid. Ken Coakley, here we go. As a guy who only got a few Blu-rays this year, I would say that my favorite U.S. disc is Hard Rock Zombies. It's just as zany as I remember when I saw it for the first time in 19 in the 80s. I love the fact that there was heavy metal horror subgenre because most of them came out during my metal days back in the 80s. I want to show this to my best friend, but she's in another state. Another great release was the Imprint Via Vision 3-disc set of The Wicker Man. I couldn't fi find the extended cut on the streaming service, and I preferred that version. For one thing, it includes the song Gently Johnny, being played by the late great uh, Paul Giovanni. Giovanni as Ash Buchanan is walking up the stairs to heaven to be with the perpetually hot Brick Uckland. I also am looking forward to the few titles coming in the next few months by Arrow, including The Shawscope 2, The Barefooted Kid is a really good movie, as well as the two-movie Count Yorga collection and the Italian Gothic 4 movie set. Arrow is looking really good this year. Great information. Um, Zach Nolan, Let's Scare Justice Again to Death is one of my top five favorite horror films. Pure atmosphere. Favorite Blu-rays of the year, The Living Dead at Manchester Morgue and Tombs of the Blind Dead. Love those. Um, that Easy Misio, first time I saw Yellbrick Road, the ending puzzled the crap out of me. I need to revisit, but it's been over a decade or so since I last seen the film. Anthropophagus and Let's Scare Jessica the both are both excellent. Exciting releases this year, Deaf Evil Dead Trap 2, Blu-ray stunned me and brought me to te my tear to my eye. I'm still waiting for it to ship. Also, Cure 4K and Criterion, fucking amazing. Martyrs Blu-ray, another great one. My dumbass placed the Martyrs Blu-ray and Messiah of Evil Blu-ray in the same order from Diabolic, and after two months or so of wondering where my Messiah movie was at, and I didn't realize that I had to wait for Martyrs to ship with it. Just received my email. It ships so excited to finally get both and retire my Messiah DVD. It's a great year for horror to say the least. For sure. Joe Carroll. Great show as usual. Fire. Thank you. I love my Everything, Everywhere, All at Once media book released by Lean, uh, Leonine. Two of the Midori Impulse releases. Nowhere Girl cover A and Midori uh, the Camilla Girl cover B and Maniac Driver cover B from 8 Films. I know you Americans aren't too interested in media books, etc. But we often have a choice if we want the movie and they look cool. Probably mentioned this before, but I even have a media book with you on the cover. Well, it's got to be the bad man, right? Mary A. Lilly, the second sight release of Dog Soldiers, such an improvement over the DVD release, and hopefully the Scream Factory Blue as well. Jeff Gardner, Tombs of the Blind Dead by Synapse, the deluxe version. So, um, you know, I'm not going to do a question. Why not? I don't feel like doing it. If I feel if I have a question to ask, I will. But if I don't, off the top of my head, from now on, I'm just gonna free ball it. Maybe I, I do. I won't do them. Maybe I will do them. So you can leave your comments and your concerns and anything referencing any of the movies I said. Please feel free to comment, and I will read them next week. So, but we don't need the question, right? Because usually I go on Facebook, and a lot of times I'll get crazy answers or you know it's a lot of the people that don't even watch the show answering and yada 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 so anyways there's no update so we're just gonna have this weird jittery cut again because i'm saving money for cinema wasteland you know how it goes um cinema wasteland's at the end of september early october so it is what it is i gotta save my money uh you know be penny pinch all that kind of stuff anyways i'm out of here guys
All right, guys. Thank you very much for watching. As always, have a good one. Me.